And it's a wonderful thing that in Christ we've got to become as little children. You know, there are two types of people always in every church. It's the awful thing. There's the imitators and then there's the partakers. I remember once someone offered me a book and I don't know whether it was a good book or a bad book because I never got round to reading it. Somehow I couldn't. The title just turned me off. It was called The Imitation of Christ. And I think that that sums up what religion is, what our efforts are, imitations. I hear people sometimes cry out for reality. If only they knew, if only they understood, there is only one life of Christ. That's the life he lives. There is only one source of life, and that's him. All our efforts and all our vain religion is useless. Christ is our righteousness. Unless we have his life, unless his life becomes our life, we have imitation. We don't have the reality. And he wants to give us the reality. He wants us to have that which is genuine. He came to give us life. And life more abundant. And do you know when he came to give us life? That life is in him. That life is the very essence, the very reality of God. That's what he came to give us. I find so many people try to be something. They try to attain by doing, and they never see that the source of all is him. He's everything. Everything. When God came and sent his son, in him was life. And he is life. And he wants to live his life in us. The only thing we have to do, and the only thing it is, is stop trying and get out of the way. And let the King of Glory in. Huh. If only we'd just believe. <laughs> if only we'd really understand that this wonderful God of all glory has come to live in our hearts. I listen to prayers and I listen to people's crying and I listen to people bemoaning their lot and I listen to people telling God, how filthy, how wretched they are, how desperate they are, how empty they are. And I often think, you know, Lord, that's a lie, really. If you're born from above, you have the very king of creation in your heart. You have the glorious mystery of Christ in you. He's there. And oh, it's wonderful. When we began to sing that first chorus, in my heart I find such a joy begin to well up. I wanted to be a little irreverent. I wanted to get up and shout and jump and say, Lord, it's true. It really is. It's you. You're everything. I'm afraid there's times when I want to shrug off religion and just be. And allow that glorious, wonderful joy to burst forth. 
and say, Lord, it's true. It really is. You came to give me life and life more abundant. And that life is in you. Have you ever wondered what a Christian life really is? It's Christ. It's not a standard I've got to live. It's not some idea of the critics. It's not the gossip's standard. It's God's. And God's standard is Jesus. And the way he is is so different from our human understanding. I remember when I was first converted, everyone told me, and they were correct, that I was totally and utterly hopeless. You know, they, they, they could tell you so many things wrong, and every single thing they said that was wrong was only a millionth part of what they actually saw on the outside. But they missed the one essential thing that was true. I had Jesus in my heart. And that wonderful king of glory somehow was going to take the mess that I was and was going to make it into something for his praise and for his glory. He was going to do it. He took the thing that wasn't and he said, all right, that's what I'm going to work with because no one could ever say it was anything of him. <laughs> they said, they said lots. I hear that some people have commented to your pastor here. He told me, you know, one or two people had come up to him and they said, well, it was a lovely conference, but the greatest miracle of all was the change in Michael. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you want to know the secret? I've learned just a little, little secret. Get out of his way. I don't think I've learned it very well, and I'm not very good at it, but I've learned that if we get out and let him work, he does things. And if we let his life flow and we realize it's all from him, it's wonderful. I think the worst thing is for a Christian to worship himself, don't you? Don't you? I know I mustn't keep asking you those questions. It becomes a habit and makes you respond. But do you know how you worship yourself? Let me tell you. Go something like this. Oh God, I'm so wretched, filthy, vile. There's so much wrong with me. I, I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of my own reality. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of that. I, 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 vile. In fact, I find sometimes people want to compete with other people to tell God how bad they are. It's called self-worship. Do you know if I looked in my Bible and trying to find Paul or one of the great apostles expressing his badness, I wouldn't find it. I'd find that he was expressing Christ and lifting him up. Hmm? He got his eyes on the one who had come to change it all. Of course, there's not, nothing good in us. We know that, don't we? Haven't we discovered that as we've tried? Haven't we discovered as we've tried to live the life that we can't? Haven't we discovered the futility of trying to aspire to a standard until we realize the wonder of it all that Jesus has come to live his life in us? I have been thinking over these days, and it's a question that's come to my heart. You Forgive me if I just share a little secret. I wonder why God zaps people. I have. I've really begun to wonder and I've asked questions. And do you know what I think the answer is? I wonder, and this is only a suggestion, I, but I feel in my heart it's probably true that it's the only way to shut them up and let him work. 
It's the only way he can finally just get them out of the way and do something for them. So he lays them down to sleep, as he did with our first Adam who <laughs> produced Eve. He took a rib, as he did with Abraham. He thinks, how on earth can I get them to stop so I can? How on earth can I get them to realize that the source of everything is in me? I don't think it's a sign of spirituality. I think it's a sign of immaturity that people have to be laid out like that. It's a sign that God wants to work a work. Oh, it's a wonderful sign. It shows that God's working. Hallelujah for that. But do you know the source of all is really within? Is inside. Paul wrote about it and he thrilled at saying the mystery that's been hid from the ages. This great mystery. Christ in you. The hope of glory. It's not some external thing. It's not something I'm trying for. So often our terminology and our, our thinking gets so wrong. We're struggling. Look what Paul says in Romans. Just turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. Look, we need to turn our hearts and come back to a biblical base. A base of truth when we come to Christ. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Sometimes when I listen to prayers, it's as though people are trying to reach up and pull God down from heaven to meet their need. They're trying to reach up and say, oh God, I want you to come down. Now there's a truth in it. But it's only part truth. We sing, rend the heavens and come down. And there's a time when God will come and corporately fill his temple. But we've become, each individual has become a temple of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus Christ has come to live in our hearts by faith. He's come to indwell us and that glorious hope, Christ in me. It's the hope of my glory. Christ in me. Not Christ in heaven, but inside. In my heart and in my life. Energizing my spirit. Giving me a life. I'm not reaching up trying to get a blessing from heaven. No. I look within and find the glorious truth. That light of God has come in my heart. And I don't have to look and go on as... As Paul said, or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. I don't have to go down into hell and try and reach up. I don't have to take my heart down there. I don't have to take my mind down there and tell him how awful I am. I don't have to try and ascend into heaven and pretend and be religious. And I don't have to be self-denigrating. I don't have to be someone who pushes and pretends. All I have to do is realize the glorious truth. The glorious truth. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thine heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. It's not somewhere up there and it's not somewhere de where down there. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. I'm born of God. I'm a son of God. And that spirit of Christ is within. I know that confession. If we confess with the, thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. It's believing with the heart, not with the head. It's with the heart and the emotion and every part of your being you believe and you know. He's risen. And you're saved. 
We come to God with faith. We don't come with unbelief. We don't come with doubt. We don't come with fear. Because we've been born from above, we can come with hearts full of faith, knowing that this Christ of God has begotten us again unto a living hope. That he's come in our hearts and he dwells in our hearts. And that it's real. The Christ who walked on earth, who healed the sick, who delivered the captive, is the same Jesus who lives in our hearts. Who's come to indwell us. The same all-conquering, all-powerful, almighty one lives in us. That's the great mystery. The greatest prophet of all, John the Baptist, who did no miracle, turned and he looked at this Jesus and he said, I'm not even worthy to unloose the latchet of his shoe. That same Jesus lives in your heart. He lives in my heart. The same Jesus, the Jesus Christ, the risen one, who went to a tomb and caused very death itself to turn pale and tremble, who caused the devils in hell to tremble. That same Jesus who stood at the mouth of a tomb and called for someone and broke the power of death and took the keys away and said, See, even death can't stand against me. That same Jesus dwells in you. Is alive in you. The Jesus who could raise the dead lives in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Isn't that wonderful? Say, well, I thought it was in the church. I thought it was in, in meeting with people. I thought it was in this. I thought it was in that. I thought it was in pray being prayed for. No, it's in your heart. The living Christ has risen with healing in his wings, in your heart. He's inside. I need to go inward to find the reality. I need to realize that I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, the scripture says. Why? Because it's God who works in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's the Christ within who does it. My only way of living the Christian life is to get out of the way and let that life of his flow forth. That takes away the struggle, doesn't it? Hmm? I remember, I think it was a, an African evangelist was asked what he did when tempted of the devil, and he said, oh, it's simple. He said, when the devil comes and knocks on the door of my heart, I just send Jesus to answer the door. <laughs> when you know he's there. Amen. We get so grown up. We become so mature. We become gray-haired in our spiritual realm. We think we've progressed. But the best progression of all is to realize we've got nowhere. And to see that he's everything. And I want to get out of the way and let him work out that glorious life in me. He's so wonderful. I love him. I know of no other source of life but Jesus. I don't want to be an imitator. I don't want to aspire to live that life and say, oh God, I'll live that life. What I realize is, Lord, I can't. But it's in your nature to be that. It's in your very nature and in the very essence of you to be what you are. And I want that living river to flow forth, that living life to come forth from the very depths of my being. I want you to have your full sway, full control, and do with me what you will. I see so many people bound by legalism, by laws. Today, in this nation, you have apostles, great men, 
You have great teachers. I've watched some of them on, I don't know what it is, past the time or past the, I don't know what. Um, television channel, I, I, we don't have that in England, so you'll have to forgive me, but I've taken the opportunity of looking because I, I don't go to many churches and I don't visit many places, so I thought I'd have a look to see the way it was. And I would turn on and look and hear all sorts of ideas and all sorts of things and people putting all, sort, all sorts of ideas forward and telling people how they could do this and how they could do that, stories of crystal cathedrals and all sorts. And I was fascinated. So fascinated I turned it off after five minutes or so, this one. <laughs> Or look for another channel with another one on and thought, isn't there anything better? It fascinated me. And do you know what I found? There were so few that pointed to him and said, look, you can't, but he is. He is what he is. That's it. I believe that healing is in him. And you have the healer, the divine physician, dwelling in your heart. I believe that deliverance is in him. And you have the deliverer dwelling in your heart. I believe that cleansing and sanctification is in him. And you have the one who was set apart, dwelling in your heart. I believe that all the wonderful glory is come into your heart, but it comes as a seed that must grow, as a tender plant that must come forth. When we're born from above, we receive the seed of life, but it must grow forth. And it will. Fruit will come if you just abide in him. If you want to be mature, the easiest thing to do is get out of the way and let him. In fact, it's the secret that Jesus told. You'll find it in John's Gospel, chapter 15. John 15. For, do you know if I could read this into my own ear every morning and I could say, Michael, don't ever forget this. It would be something that I think would keep me and I'm sure it'll be a word that'll keep you. Abide in me, said Jesus, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you accept you abide in me. Now, there is no way you can develop in Christ except by abiding in him. And by abiding in him, it means you allow his life to flow out through you. No branch ever drew life from the soil of its own ability. There was a stem, there's a root. And it's fascinating, if you look at a vine, you'll find that that which is fruit-bearing is very short. It's branches that come from the stem, the stem of the vines, a dead wood. They look like dead wood. And yet they have life in them, and you'll see the shoots come out, and they're very short. If they grow too long, they become fruitless. That's why they're always trimmed back. Too many people have got too much of their own life. But when we're cropped close to him, glorious fruit comes forth. We're not drawing and drawing and drawing the life for ourselves, but we're keeping close to him. And glorious clusters of grapes come forth. Beautiful to see. There's something so wonderful. Have you ever seen a branch? bearing fruit of itself. Can you imagine a branch like some Christians really trying? You walk by a tree and you hear, Oof, as the branch tries to produce fruit. 
Have you heard its struggles and its groans? Have you ever noticed how it's straining itself? I haven't. In fact, when I walk down, I find it hard sometimes to, to be enthusiastic. I know there's life there, but it seems to take so long to produce that fruit. We've got a pear tree in the garden. It produces beautiful blossom, and then it produces lots of pears. And I find I'm allergic to them, <laughs> so I don't eat them. But do you know something about it? It seems to take so long. I, I go and I look, and the pears are so small. It takes so long. But as long as they just stay on that tree, the abundance and the overabundance of life produces the fruit. Do you know it's an excess of life that produces fruit? When you've got an excess, fruit is produced. And when you have an excess of that flow of life flowing from Christ, richly dwelling in your heart, you'll find automatically fruits produced. That's why you prune a fruit tree and cut it back so that there can be an excess in the branch. There's an excess of life. And that excess of life produces fruit. That's why you get more fruit when you prune a plant. The roots learn to draw and that excess of life just flows out to the branch and all oh, fruit comes. And you say, why? That's wonderful. And the father comes along, and do you know he snips us back? We get too mature, too intelligent, too clever, and father comes along with the sick of tears, and you get cut down to size. Something happens in your life, and you realize you're not as great as you thought you were. You haven't aspired and got anywhere, really, and you feel chopped right back to the start, and so you should be. And you come back, and... You wonder what's happened and you think, and yet, do you know the most beautiful thing about it? Fruit comes. It tells you here, Jesus said this is the way it was going to be. Every branch in me, verse 2, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Do you know what Jesus tells us? His father comes along and he's cutting us back all the time. He's coming, and with his love and his grace, he's purging us, and he's cutting us back, and he's causing circumstances to come that bring us more and more to depend on him. The pressures of life shouldn't make us more strong in ourselves, but should make us realize our total inability. And then we don't spend all our time bemoaning it and trying to get strength. We turn ourselves over to him and say, I can't, but I know you can. And as we go on in life, we learn more and more that we cannot, but he is. He's everything, isn't he? Some of you were touched over the conference. All God was trying to say to you was, look, you can't, but I am. That's all. He was just trying to show you that in his love and in that wonderful grace of his, he'll do it for you. Because he knows you can't, he knows I can't, so he says, it's all right. Don't worry. I've come to live my life in you. I've come to make you what I desire you to be. I've come to conquer the things you can't conquer. Now get out of the way and let me. And as we do that and as we allow that dealing of God to go on in our life, we find more and more our life becomes all of him. He came in wonderful grace, not so you should depend on an experience on someone praying for you. Of course not. Don't ever depend on that. Don't ever look for that. Look within to the one who's the source of it all, really. Do you know it was really the faith that he birthed from that well within you that caused those things to happen so well i thought it was outside oh no no you were helped in your faith maybe you were drawn to the one who's the source of all life and really he dwells inside he's the one who did it all and he's the one we love and he's the only one isn't he wonderful
Do you know he really does dwell in your heart? Stop trying to pull him down from heaven. Stop trying to be. I remember when I was first converted, I stayed with a, a brother. He was a Negro. He was a heroin addict before I met him. He'd been a mainliner for nine years. He was still alive, and God began to touch his heart. And He went off to this uh, center to get delivered, and he heard that Christ could deliver people. And I remember him telling me the story of how one day he went out desperate. He was addicted to the drug, and he was desperate for deliverance. Get delivered, and he heard that Christ could deliver people. And I remember him telling me the story of how one day he went out desperate. He was addicted to the drug, and he was desperate for deliverance. And he told me he went out to this mountainside beside the place he was on. It was a type of farm. And he climbed this mountain, and he said there were thick trees and woods. And he went up where he thought no one would hear him, right into the woods. And when he got right up there, he began to open his heart to God. But somehow he'd got all the wrong idea. And so what he did, is he thought, well, God's a long way away. I better let him know. So he began to pray like this. Jesus! And he said he shouted and shouted and shouted. And do you know the wonderful thing? Jesus came. Totally delivered him. Totally set him free. He understands our feebleness. He knows our misunderstandings. But I remember him looking at me and grinning. The love just oozed out of him. And he said, man, he said, I was so way out. So way out. Another little story told me he went home after he was delivered. And, and there was this woman dying of cancer. And I, I don't know if I told you this story. But he, he, he knew that it said in the Bible, you should anoint the sick with oil and pray for them. And this auntie of his was dying of cancer and she was in bed and she'd turned yellow and so you know there was the scripture anoint them with oil so he hadn't got any oil so he went down to the supermarket Kmart I suppose and he bought a large bottle of cooking oil now he wasn't refined or religious so he went to his auntie's bedroom he took the cork off he pulled back the sheet and he anointed her <laughs> what happened she stood out of bed totally healed Oh, to have the faith of a baby. Hmm? Oh, to get rid of our great religious aspirations and just become simple again. Do you remember the way it used to be? Do you remember the day you were first converted when Christ first touched your heart? When the reality of salvation, forgiveness of sins, and the glory of God first touched you? Do you remember? Do you remember how you walked on air, your heart danced? And oh, you could believe for a mountain to be removed. You could believe for anything because Jesus had become so alive inside, so real. Do you remember? Do you remember shouting and singing and dancing and stamping? Well, I do. I remember the way it was. And do you know that's what we've got to return to? That's what we've got to live in that type of faith. Do you know you're meant to make your request known with thanksgiving? We're meant to come to our God with faith in our hearts. Not wavering, not doubting, but believing in the one who's able. Believing in the one who loves us. The one who is life unto us. Not coming cringing and and cajoling and begging and pleading and moaning and telling him, oh, but oh Lord, I know you love me. I know you've saved me. I know you've redeemed me. It's coming with a heart full of faith unto the one who loves us. You know, he wants you to believe him. He wants you to know the glorious mystery that's been hid from the ages. 
The glorious mystery that the prophets seek to look into. Christ in you. He lives in your heart. That man of Calvary, that man of Calvary lives inside of you. He's come to live in you. He's come to pour out his life in you. He's come to dig a well in your soul. And he's come to let it burst forth into life. Take the stones off the well. Take the unbelief away and let that life flow forth. That's all. He said, if you come, you thirst, come and drink, and it'll be a well springing up. So many people have have turned outward. They're looking at the outward. When if we just go the inward, we'll find he was there all the time. I've looked and so often I've wondered why people lose what they have. Of course, they don't really lose it. They leave it. And this morning, I'd just like to recommend you to do one thing. Remember. Just turn your heart back. Look within and see the one who saved you. Look within and see the one who birthed you. Look within and see the source of all life, Jesus, your Savior. Remember and turn back. If you turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, you'll remember The complaint and it was a complaint the complaint that God had verse 4 of chapter 2 nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love do you know we do the leaving somehow we get religious somehow we get taught And somehow we pick up ideas and notions and we lose our simplicity and we lose our childlikeness and we lose the wonderful innocence of childhood. We lose it. We we grow up. We develop. We get inflated. We go up like barrage balloons. We get ideas of what we've got and what we are. And we need to come back and say, just a minute, what was that first love like? You know, the first love that got hold of you, where Jesus became everything to you. The first time when life quickened your soul and you realized the wonder that you were saved, you were redeemed, you were a child of God, and the Holy Ghost flooded the love of God abroad in your heart, you'd have kissed a cow if it had been there. Your whole being was so overwhelmed with love. You you were so thrilled. You loved everyone and everything. Do you remember? I remember it well. All you've got to do is return to it. You've got to start remembering those times and remember Jesus really is in you. Jesus Christ, that wonderful Redeemer, the one who cares for the individual, Do you remember over the conference we talked about the one who came to the leper? The leper identified himself. Jesus never went into the details of his leprosy. He never said, stick out your hands. How many fingers are missing? Now let me see your toes. How many toes are missing? Now let me see the other hand. Let me look at your ears. Let me look at your eyes. Stick your tongue out. I want to see the color. Now, do you read that in your Bible? He just came and he said, Lord, I'm a leper. That's all Jesus needed to know. I've met people who think that there's deliverance in telling. There used to be a woman, she'd come to me time after time. She had mental problems. And she would spend hours talking about her problems. No one understood her because she'd been like this. It was the way she was brought up and... And one day she came and 
I was sitting there and in my place where I saw her because I felt that I just couldn't turn her away. Um, I have a reclining chair and my wife was there too. And she started and she went on. She went on and I went to sleep. I'd heard it so many times. I just, quite honestly, I was a bit tired. And so I took some refreshment in the Lord. Well, <laughs> well she just went on and went on. And I woke about 35 minutes later. My wife knew that I'd gone to sleep. And she was embarrassed by it, but she just kept her place on a chair. And, you know, apparently I nodded every so often. I guess I just nodded off. But there you are. And I woke up, and she was still carrying on. Still talking. She hadn't stopped. She didn't need anyone to, you know, I was a good listener. She went on and on. That's self-worship. And sometimes that's how we get with God. <laughs> I think he just goes to sleep. He said, oh, goodness me. <laughs> Not again. I... <laughs> <laughs> the Lord gets fed up with your moans. Could you imagine having a wife like that? If you tape some of your prayers, one day tape it, go and speak it into a tape recorder and then listen to it back and think whether you'd like to live with someone like that. Whew. And then think that God has to put up with you. It's terrible. Off she'd go. No one understands me. You can see them in a meeting. You can tell. They're blubberized. You can perfect the practice of it, if you like. Self-pity, it's called. No one understands me, Lord. Here I am. Oh, I'm so filthy, so foul. You don't really believe it. It's the play acting. We think God likes it. We think the Lord loves to hear the moans of his people. He delighteth in the moanings of his people. He doesn't. He delights in praises. You know, he rejoices, and it rejoices his heart when you're full of joy, the joy of the Lord. When you come, you're... You ought to make your request made known with thanksgiving. Now you think about it. When you come to God for something, is it with thanksgiving? I'm so wretched. I'm so bad. Oh, deliver me. Thank you. I'm like this. Deliver me. I don't think you do that, do you? This self-worship. We've got to get out of that habit and say, Lord, you know, I'm a leper. And spare him the details. He knows anyway. And get your heart lifted up to the one who transforms. You know we're transformed from glory to glory as in the face of Jesus Christ. It's not when we see ourselves and spend our times on ourselves. It's when we see him and we gaze on him and our hearts are full of love for him. When he becomes the first love of our life instead of ourselves, when we begin to get out of the way and let him, that's faith. The word is nigh you. Even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You don't have to climb into heaven. You don't have to descend down to the deepest depth. You just look within and find that Christ of God who saved you, that Christ of God who cleansed you, dwells richly in your heart. And he is your deliverer. He's your healer. He's all you need. And your sufficiency is in him. If you want reality, it's in him. Stop being religious. Stop trying. 
and allow his life to work in you. That was the mystery that was hidden. The angels have never known this. They diligently wanted to seek into this. They wanted to understand it, but they never could. It was kept back. The prophets of old, they heard about it, they prophesied about it, and their hearts diligently sought, but this they could never taste. The glorious truth that this resurrected one would come and live in our hearts and would be everything we need and we could draw our life from him, that inward source, Christ in you, the hope of glory. A church is only here, friend, not to deliver you, not to heal you, but to lift him up that you might know that you can find your need in him, that he will dwell in your heart and be with you wherever you go and be a light to your feet, a joy in your soul, a power in your being that will conquer all. And in that day bring you victorious, without fault, perfected by him. He'll have done it. He'll have taken you, this treasure, which has been put in an earthen vessel. You'll still be an earthen vessel. You still have your own human frailties, but you have within you the most glorious treasure of all eternity. You have the very Son of God and his life in you. And that life will perfect and transform your soul as you draw from him. And that life will quicken your being. He came to show you that he's real. He came to show you by manifesting his power that he cares for you, that he loves you. But most of all, he came to show you that that life can be yours. That living life is yours. He's come to live in us. He's come to flood our souls and flood our hearts with life and life more abundant. And that life is him. In him is life. You just look with me. There's one more scripture in 1 John. Just so you can see it's there in the book. In 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. Now don't ever tell God you haven't got life. If you're born from above and God's met you and God's cleansed you and God's filled you, you've got life. Now let that life flow forth. See that it's the inward well you need, not some outward pulling of God down from heaven, not some drawing up from the depths, but an inward springing forth of that wonderful life that's within. The joy that fills my soul. I remember, just before I left home, I shared the word on, Remember from whence thou art fallen. You've left your first love. Just remember it. Do you know you can come back just by remembering? Remember the way it was. Remember how your heart was. Remember the thrill, how thrilled you were with Jesus. Just remember. And you can come straight back to that place and you repent and just do the first works. That's all he told the church to do in Revelation. He didn't say now make restitution. He didn't say now try this, now try that. He just said remember and do. You fill your heart with love for him. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. That's all. Lord, I understand now that it's you I'm to love. It's you I'm to adore. It's you I'm to look to. And as I get more and more filled with you, you'll deliver me, you'll cleanse me, you'll change me, you'll transform me. I'll find my source in you. You'll be everything I need. Everything. Isn't he wonderful? That one who made death tremble, 
Can you imagine death trembling and going pale when the king of glory came to the grave? He said, that's the end of your power. That same one is in you. That same one lives in you. The one who called forth Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead lives in you. Isn't he able to do all things? Well, isn't he? What have you got to fear? Just look within and say, Lord, I draw my life from you. Begin to have faith in God. Not faith in yourself, not faith in an experience, but have faith in God. Put your trust in him. Say, Lord, you live within. Two shall conquer. Ten thousand. It's wonderful. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe you. I know this glorious truth, Christ in you. And he dwells in me. He dwells in you. Doesn't he? So I can come with joy, can't I? Can't I come with thanksgiving? Can't I come with a song and a shout and a jump? Can't I come with great rejoicing and say, Lord, because you live, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> I can face anything because you're alive. I can face anything because you live within me and I know that you'll be more than a conqueror for all I face. Of course there'll be the dealings, of course there'll be the transformations, but I must always start from the basis of which is the source of life. It's him. Amen? Live in that. Don't ever look for the outward. Look for the inward. Begin to seek the inward reality where Christ is, where Christ dwells in the heart by faith. Let's pray. Oh, sweet mystery. God hid from ages, hidden secret from all prophets and all sages, mystery divine, the hope of all his children. It is Christ in you. Father, thank you that you live and dwell in our hearts. Thank you you've saved us and redeemed us and washed us and cleansed us. Thank you, you broke the powers that shackled our hearts. You brought light into our souls. You brought love into our beings. You set our hearts aflame with love for you. And Lord, we thank thee that thou dost dwell in our hearts. So often we've forgotten. We've sought to draw you down from heaven. We've sought to dig into the depths to find you. And then we've remembered. We've found the stirring of your spirit in the depths of our heart. And we've realized we had left you, the source of life. But Lord, today we want to give thanks to you and acknowledge you. Residing deep within our hearts, Christ in spirit holy dwelling deep within making us the temple of the living God, Christ in you and you in Christ in deepest mystery, that his own be one in him and he in them. That's the truth. Lord, thank you, it's true. Let faith rise in every heart this morning. Let there come, O oh Lord, within each soul a realization it's true. It's really true. That glorious King of grace dwells in my heart. Lo, the rising of that life I find within. That stirring of his spirit, I find it's there. He never left. He never went away. He's there within. Oh, wonderful deliverer. Wonderful Savior, I love you. I want to dwell in you. I want to praise your name and extol thee for all eternity. Oh, sweet mystery of God hid from the ages, hidden secret.
children from all prophets and all sages. Mystery divine, the hope of all his children. Tis Christ in you residing deep within your heart. Christ in spirit, holy dwelling deep within you. Making you the temple of the living God. Christ in you and you in Christ in deepest mystery. That his own throne be one in him and he in them. O sweet mystery of God in from the ages. We in secret from and all sages, mystery divine, the hope of all his children, is Christ in you, residing deep within your heart, was in spirit, holy, dwelling deep within you, making you